lean forward. Yeah. Welcome uh, to Center for 20th Century Studies uh, lecture this afternoon. I'm the Richard Bruchman. I'm the director of the Center for 20th Century <coughs> Studies. Happy to have you here today, and uh, very happy as well to have uh, David Redwas here to join us. Um, last year, we were thinking about uh, programming for this year. And one of the things that sort of seemed kind of like a no-brainer was to do something related to the election uh, in the fall. It seemed as if uh, people would be interested in thinking about electoral politics on the eve of uh, presidential elections. <coughs> and uh, we wanted to figure out how to handle that. I was having a conversation um, somewhere around that time with uh, Teresa Mangum, who's the uh, director of the Oberman Center for the Humanities at the University of Iowa. And Teresa said, oh, you have to invite David Redloss. Um, sadly, he's no longer my colleague, but, but was at the University of Iowa for several years. Um, and so I took a look at his work, and uh, as usual, Teresa's recommendation was spot on. And uh, I was really happy then to invite David and uh, set up this talk. Um, David's work focuses on a variety of things, but what we'll be talking about today and what really most interested me was his uh, emphasis on the role of emotion in uh, political decision making, and I think probably in decision making generally. Uh, many of us in the English and the humanities have been thinking about emotion uh, coded as affect uh, more specifically for quite some time now, and uh, my answer to the question is rationality overrated is sort of an unabashed yes. Uh, I know there are people in this room who would uh, disagree. Um, and I've been spending my time on, uh, on Facebook and social networks, uh, you know, uh, commenting on the current electoral cycle and on the role of affect uh, in that. So I'm really eager to hear what David has to say. Uh, David Redwatch received his PhD from Rutgers University in uh, political science in 1997, is that right? He taught at the University of Iowa uh, for uh, about 10 years and then fairly recently has moved to Rutgers University where he's professor of political science and director of the Eagleton Institute of Politics Center for Public in Interest only. He's also the co-editor of the journal uh, Political Psychology. He's uh, authored or edited uh, five books, published numerous articles, and has had uh, lots of opportunities to speak in the media and various other forums. So I'm really looking forward to hear, uh, hearing what he has to say today, and we look forward to do that. I'll give you David Reynolds. Hopefully this is on, right? Okay, good. Well, uh, thanks for coming. Thanks for having me here. It's a, it's a beautiful day outside there. I understand tomorrow my flight back. It's not going to be quite as nice, but I've been able to enjoy it for the last two days in any case. Nice fall weather here in the, in the Midwest. I, I loved the 10 years I was at Iowa, and it's a really a little just a little jarring actually to be back on the East Coast. Um, just because the pace of life is a little crazier, to, to put it mildly. It's nice because there are some things like hop the train and get into New York City, but on the other hand, um, it's New Jersey, and we have a governor who kind of epitomizes everybody's view of New Jersey, right? Uh, uh, earlier this week, in fact, we had a little emergency meeting at the Eagle Institute because the governor went on, went on record as calling the uh, Rutgers Eagle from Paul said I have one word for it, it's crap. At a, at a uh, press event when he was asked about his latest polling numbers. So um, for whatever good or bad might have happened in Iowa, nobody ever called my work crap. Now, you may or may not by the time we're done here today, but that's a different uh, entirely. So uh, what I want to do today is talk a little bit about um, rationality and about emotions and how emotions play a really important role in decision making, uh, based somewhat on my own research, on some other research as well, 
and um, answer the question, I, I hope, in some, uh, in some form or another. Uh, so, so this is about decision making today, and the, and the fact is we make thousands of decisions every day, most of which are made all but automatically. We tend to not think about most of them, and it's a good thing we don't, because if we had to think about every decision we make, we would just be overwhelmed very, very quickly. Think about it in some sense like driving a car, right? Or better yet, don't think about driving a car, because as soon as you start thinking about how you drive a car, it turns out to be really hard to do, right? And if I ask you to explain how you drive a car, you're gonna, you know, step by step, you're not gonna be able to pull that out of your head very quickly, very easily, because essentially, even though it's a continuous stream of decisions, they're, they're basically automatic decisions. When you first learned to drive, it was pretty hard, right? Or when you taught your kids to drive, it was pretty hard. But now, it's all the second nature. A, a little story about this, that uh, my wife doesn't mind me telling, but it's an important story about automatic decision making, which is she had, I, I, we were at, um, uh, back in New Jersey the first time before going to Iowa, I got a call one day in my office and she said, I'm not quite sure where I am, I'm definitely not where I thought I was going. I said, what do you mean? She said, well, I just realized I've been driving for the last five miles or so up a road that I don't know without being aware of doing it. And she basically had had what later was determined to be an absence seizure, but she was driving and she drove perfectly safely. As far as we tell, she stopped at stop signs and traffic lights and made the turns and had no problem at all because generally when we're driving, we're not actually processing things all that consciously when you're an experienced driver. It's an example of automatic processing, essentially automatic decision making. Now, Having put that forth, we're not really interested in those kinds of decisions today. They are interesting, particularly when something goes wrong, but I'm much more interested in this question of rationality. I'm much more interested in conscious processing, conscious thinking. What are we doing with the, the big decisions that we actually do need to think about uh, from day to day? And so what we're used to hearing all the time, of course, from our parents, from our teachers, from other people. Don't be so emotional. Think before you act. Count to 10. Take it easy. All these things meant to say separate your emotions from your thinking, from your decision making, that you'll make better decisions if you're not so emotional about it. Right? And that, I think, is true generally. Meant to say separate your emotions from your thinking, from your decision making that you'll make better decisions if you're not so emotional about it, right? I mean, that I think is true generally, right? And it comes in, in Western thinking, of course, really out of the idea of the Enlightenment where we separated reason from emotion, where you have things like Newton talking about, not in these exact words, but essentially positing a rational universe of laws that can be discovered You'll hope on life's vast ocean, diversely we sail, reason a card, passion to jail. And of course, Descartes, I think, therefore I am. And, and by the way, I want you to know I'm a social scientist, but I just did a Pope thing, so I, I need credit for that. But, um, <laughs> in any case, um, it, it's not, this is not unimportant. The idea that, in fact, um, emotion is the opposite of reason that reason is to be prized, that humans are rational characters, that's what separates us from the animals, uh, and that emotion, passion, is a threat. It's dangerous. You know, the, the U.S. constitutional founders write about this all the time. Madison writes about the passion of party and how we need to design a system to keep that from overwhelming, from taking over. We need to thwart passion. One of the ways that I learned to make decisions, in a sense, and it, it was my mother who taught me this. She didn't tell me in the context of Ben Franklin, but it's essentially Ben Franklin's decision-making rule. And what Franklin wrote was, my way is to divide a half sheet of paper by a line into two columns, writing over one pro and the other con. Then during three or four days' consideration, I put down, under the different head, short hints of the different motives that might affect the decision about whether to do it, right? 
And then I endeavor to put weights on those, and I'm showing weighting by striking out unimportant ones, and ultimately find at length where the balance lies. Right? We've all gathered that that had something to do with my decision making about whether to come here today. <laughs> Not to but, you know, the nice people, fun topic part, I thought, for sure. It was tough for me to find cons to put in this example. But the point is, of course, this is supposed to be a very kind of rational process. Think about it over time, list the pros and cons, add some kind of weight, because some pros and cons are more important than other pros and cons in some rational kind of form. And then ultimately, you, you strike things out and you get down to the weight of the evidence. Well, I should go. Right? So that's the kind of thing that comes out of that thinking and that feeds into the idea that reason and emotion are to be separated and kept separate in our decision making processes. So, rational decision making then. Um, typically, this is from uh, Janice and Mann. Thoroughly canvas a wide range of alternative courses of action. Make sure you're looking at all the possible things you could do as related to this decision. Survey the full range of objectives to be fulfilled and the values that are implicated by the choices that you might make. So that you not only need to know the alternatives, you need to determine what the outcome of those alternatives looks like or might look like if you choose them. Then carefully weigh the costs and risks of negative consequences as well as positive consequences that could flow from each alternative and intensely search for new information relevant to further evaluation of the alternative. This is a pretty detailed process. It's a pretty hard process. But this is essentially, the, in, in general terms, the prescription of how you should work to make decisions in a in a, a non-emotional, reasonable, let's say rational kind of way. As a political scientist, who in particular studies voting, um, I'm taken by this, which is uh, Stanley Kelly, way back in 1960, writes that voting decisions will be best when voters have, quote, full information about the alternatives to be voted upon and full knowledge of all the effects that would attend the choice of each alternative. Now think about whatever decision making you're making in the various elections that we'll all be voting on in a, in a couple of weeks. And, and ask yourself, do you have full information about all the alternatives to be voted upon, full knowledge of all the effects? Right? So ultimately, the summary on this point about rationality uh, is that you know, it's the gold standard. It is not just a reasoned decision, but an optimal decision optimal for achieving a particular goal or solving a problem. It's about optimizing. So if you follow a rational process, and there are very specific prescriptions and mathematical terms for a rational process, you will maximize the possibility, you will maximize the likelihood that you will make the utility maximizing decision. And I'll come back to utility in a moment. Okay. So we think of this in some ways potentially as a gold standard, as something we should shoot for, we should be rational. And, and you know, I'm not so sure. Is it really a gold standard? So here's, here's a, um, an example that I, that I like. This is a very simple example. Terrence Taxpayer, he has a decision to make because Roger Republican, who's running against Deborah Democrat for governor, proposes a one-time across-the-board $100 cut in income taxes for all of his local taxpayers to spur the sluggish economy. If Roger's proposal becomes law, Terrence needs to think in order to decide whether he supports it or not, what are the consequences for me, Terrence taxpayer, right? Well, he gets more money. Now, more money's pretty good. Everyone's kind of happy with more money, usually. It's, it's a rare person who doesn't want more money. So a reduction of taxes of 100 bucks, yay, that's great. Terrence likes it. And he can also calculate that really easily. Money's easy, right? We know what money is. It's easy to comprehend. But Terrence starts thinking a little further. And he realizes that the revenue to the government will drop. It will be less, at least in the short term. I'm not going to get into the arguments about whether lowering taxes increases revenues. So let's just assume in the immediate term, it, in fact, lowers revenues, right? That may, in fact, lead to reduced services. Now, 
some of these might be services Terrence actually uses. Maybe they won't pick up his trash as often. Maybe the street won't be plowed as well. Maybe, who knows? They are longer run. They're harder to see precisely. But it's still relatively easy for Terrence to think about this in terms of money, in terms of cost, and therefore pretty easy to integrate it into the decision. Right, the cost of this versus the benefit of that hundred dollars. But it may also be, as he starts thinking about it, there'll be less money to preserve local green space. Turns out that's an issue that's very important to Terrence. More development, maybe more jobs, maybe more traffic, more pollution, less wilderness. Right? Terrence could translate some of that into his pocketbook, most likely. It wouldn't be that hard. But that misses the point. For Terrence, green space isn't about the pocketbook. It's also symbolic. It just matters. It's what he thinks a good community should be like. And how do you quantify that? How do you put that in dollar terms? And then he thinks further. He says, well, what about the poor? You know, they're much more dependent on government services than Terrence is. Terrence is doing fine. He's not particularly worried about it. He's not among the poor. But, but to be honest, his way of looking at things he doesn't like the idea of living in a place that might balance the municipal budget on the back of the poor. That's just how he sees it. All right, I can go on. But the point here um, is that these costs and benefits ultimately have to be combined in some kind of rational manner if you're going to follow a rational choice process. How do you do that? Dollars are easy. $100 is easy to figure out. But how do you deal with the symbolic aspects of it? The bottom line problem is for a lot of decisions we make, and a huge number of political decisions we make, is something we'll call incommensurability. The inability to directly compare various outcomes. How do you directly compare 100 bucks in your pocket versus your symbolic feelings about green space? Well, um, there is a clever solution the economists came up with called the subjective expected utility. And the idea is to convert everything <coughs> into a hypothetical concept called utility. All costs and benefits can be translated into utility. And the idea is that utility, more utility is always good, less utility is always bad. Right, so if you, can, if you can create a sense that I get a certain amount of utility out of the green space, a certain amount of utility out of the dollars, a certain amount of utility about taking care of the poor, then you now have all the values commensurable. And presumably, you could make direct comparisons between them. And you can analyze how much you will gain or lose from the $100 tax cut. But, and, and, and here's, here's the big thing, would anyone actually do it? More importantly, can anyone actually do it? How much information should Terrence actually try to learn? Rationally, he needs to seek out all relevant information. And assuming he even has a mental utilities register, something up here that can easily assign utilities to outcomes, once there are more than a few outcomes to keep in mind, each weighed by some subjective probability of occurring, keeping track of the different calculations becomes really, really challenging. Now, so far, that's only one alternative. Do I like the tax cut? Do I not like the tax cut? But let's imagine instead that Terrence is making a decision between Roger Republicans' tax cut proposal and some alternative presented by Deborah Democrat. Well, the theory, rationality, would argue that he needs to seek out exactly the same information from both possibilities, do all those same calculations for both, both possibilities in order to ultimately determine which one maximizes his expected utility. Now, I'm, I'm running through this, and it sounds complicated because it actually is complicated if you try to think about what you would have to physically do to make this happen. Ultimately, because of all the calculations required, if people really did things this way, you could really characterize their processing capability as demonic. They would be, have demonic cognitive capacity, just able to do all kinds of things you just can't even imagine. And so let's even allow that maybe people can. Maybe we're wired in some way to do this utility thing. The next question is, would Terrence go through all this trouble to make a political decision? Would he collect all that information, even if he could calculate utilities and make a decision from it? And here's the issue of motivation. And it's a serious, serious challenge to the idea of rational choice. 
right? So Richard Thaler writes, failures of rationality are not because the average consumer is dumb, but rather that he does not spend all his time thinking about how to make decisions, right? If we had that free time, if we could do it that way, we could probably manage to handle things. But in the reality of life, particularly political decisions that I think about for typical voters, this is not at the highest level of the list of things people have to worry about day to day. They worry about their car run, they worry about their kids getting sick, you know, do I still have a job? And so there's not a lot of incentive, not a lot of motivation to do this massive calculation. Um, on top of that, if you actually do the rational expected utility calculation, add another piece to that, and that is, it may be that the utility you gain from one candidate winning over another candidate is significant. You may, in fact, gain, you know, that hundred bucks may mean a lot to you. But the chances that your vote are actually going to be determinative are really close to zero, right? They're really close to zero, and they're close to zero, you know, no matter, no matter what, honestly. It's every now and then we hear about elections where if somebody wins by one vote or two vote or it's tied. But even there, it's not certain that it was your vote that made any difference, right? So the way expected utility works is you take that expected benefit, right? But you've also got to look at the cost. And it turns out the cost of the information search process times your likelihood of actually mattering makes it, in fact, actually irrational to vote, which has been an ongoing problem in, in kind of the classic rational stuff that political scientists do. So the question is, lots of people do it. Now, you can get into all kinds of interesting situations, like, all right, if everyone's thinking rationally, then everyone knows it's irrational to vote. Therefore, I should vote, because I will be determined, because I'm the only one who votes. But of course, everyone will then make that next connection, and we'll just go round and round and round. Ultimately, the fact that so many people do vote and make political decisions suggests that either many people are irrational or somehow the rational choice concept or theories is, is flawed. And it's not that in assuming that people want to be rational. I think, in fact, people want to do a good job. However, they may self-define do a good job. But I think it's in pretending that people actually make decisions in the value or utility maximizing way in the first place. Um, I do believe that if a decision maker were to follow the dictates of rational choice, she would improve the chances of making what for her is the best decision. I absolutely believe that. But the problem is not so much the theory as it is the assumptions that it makes, that people can actually routinely act rationally. So, now what? Anything worth doing is worth doing well. That's certainly something that uh, my wife has always believed in, and it has really driven her crazy, And I, because what I taught my kids was anything worth doing might be worth doing adequately, or maybe sometimes good enough is just good enough. Now, she really, you know, we, we really did have some battles about that, quite honestly. Maybe good enough is good enough. Maybe it isn't true that anything worth doing is worth doing well. Right? And that's where we've got to try to find this line. Doing well on a rational choice would be maximizing your expected utility with all the things that go with that. But doing good enough, in a sense, means getting by. In a sense, it means making decisions that work most of the time. In a more specific form, Herbert Simon did a thought experiment that essentially said that as long as the organism continues to survive, it doesn't need to be rational. It just needs to find the food and the water when it needs it. It doesn't have to do a complete search for all possible sources of food, all possible sources of water, all possible pieces of information. Good enough is simply good enough. So what we're trying to do in the work we do is to understand the kind of limits that people have, some of which are driven by emotion, which is where I'm, I'm going to go next here, right? Humans probably are not the kind of demonic processors that some models of rational choice suggest. Instead, there are a lot of other ways to imagine and understand what voters actually do in campaigns, including heuristics, shortcuts. Shortcuts is a simple word for the fancy word heuristics, but ways to simplify the decision environment. 
Um, gut rationality and emotion is a kind of heuristic, a kind of way to simplify the decision environment to make sure that you do good enough most of the time. In some sense, we don't have to spend all this time being great rational processors as long as we can get by. And that turns out to be true in politics as well as in many other things in life. You know, the, the political environment, and, and if anyone's actually, I mean, I, you guys have to be inundated since you're sort of a sweet state. New Jersey, <laughs> not so much. Um, in New Jersey, you, you have to actually watch the, you know, the cable talking head shows to keep any of the ads at all. Since we're nowhere close to a sweet state, we have no media markets of our own, but the ones we have, New York is certainly not a sweet state, and Pennsylvania got pulled off the list. Oh, well, it might be tightening, but no one's been advertising anywhere around New Jersey. But you guys are presumably somewhat inundated between the presidential, the Senate race, other local and congressional races that are going on, the, the Paul Ryan effect on, on uh, the political environment, and so on. It's a complicated world. It's a complicated media environment, and there need to be ways for you, all of us, to cut through that, given that we're not going to spend a huge amount of our daily life trying to make sense of it in detail. Um, and why is this? Well, the sad reality is we have cognitive limitations. We have some pretty serious cognitive limitations. That is, we've got this amazing brain. It can do incredible things. But the challenge is actually getting stuff into it and processing the stuff when it gets into it. The, the classic work suggests that we can process in what used to generally be called working memory about seven bits of information at any given point in time, plus or minus two. Now, interestingly enough, seven bits of information is like a phone number in the days before we had to dial all 10 digits. I find I had no problem keeping track of seven-digit phone numbers. I find it much more complicated to keep track of 10-digit phone numbers. It's a really good thing, of course, that we now all have cell phones with our phone list because I couldn't do it as well. Seven digits, seven pieces of information. Now, experts, if you develop air expertise in a particular area, you can chunk information so that it becomes those seven bits aren't individual bits. If you have a phone number you just know, it's not seen as seven separate bits of information, it's one. But the bottom line is our processing is really limited, but at the same time, the potential inputs are virtually unlimited. In this room right now, if you're paying attention to me, all kinds of things could be going on over there and you're actually not going to notice it. I, I, I was gonna look for it, but I didn't have time at this point. There's a classic, classic study where audience is told to watch people throwing a basketball around. And when it's over, they're asked, what did you see? And they saw people throwing a basketball around. They run the tape. I shouldn't tell you, because if you've never seen it, you'll be stunned, but now you'll know. They run the tape again in slow motion, so you and tell you, just watch what's going on. And a guy in a gorilla suit appears, runs around, and leaves. And most people do not see it because they've been told to pay attention to the basketball as it's thrown back and forth. We have extremely limited input capability at any given point in time. And everything else goes into the bit bucket. Well, we just don't see it, and you know, we just don't do anything with it. Storage, however, is pretty easy. That is, when the information gets in, we can store it. We've got virtually unlimited permanent storage, as far as anyone can tell. So we can get it in there, if we get it in here in the first place. But retrieving from storage is another story entirely. It turns out to be exceedingly difficult to retrieve from storage, and as you get older, it turns out to be even harder to retrieve things from storage. So the retrieval is a function of the initial stimulus, how it was processed, pre-existing memory structures that it might be associated with, how often and how recently we've been exposed to the same stimuli, and our emotional state when we first encountered the stimuli and encode it. So emotions play a role also in simply encoding and decoding the information that we have in our head. But here's the thing. 
limits on memory retrieval means that one of the fundamental uh, assumptions of rational decision making is that people have pre-existing preferences for outcomes and that they are relatively fixed and immediately available is frequently not going to be the case. We don't actually quite often carry around preferences. We construct the preferences when we're asked. Rational theory argues or suggests that you need to have these pre-existing preferences you can compare your alternatives to, or the outcomes of your alternatives. Taken together, the cognitive limitations really do make that omniscient calculator, that demon, uh, kind of an unapproachable idea. We are not demonic processors. But what if information exceeds capacity? It might be a minor issue. It might not actually matter much. It might be that the information just kind of goes in one ear, out the other ear, we don't notice it, nothing happens with it, and it doesn't affect anything. So, okay, we can't be rational in the sense of learning everything about everything all the time, but at least we can get you know, whatever it is that gets in and get it back out again, and the other stuff won't hurt us. So there's an alternative possibility, which is that once cognitive capacity is exceeded, additional information is not just a matter of being ignored, it actually adversely affects the processing. It's as if the excess water you know, that went off the back of the duct suddenly starts to collect on the back of the duct, it sticks to the duct, and it becomes harder and harder for the duct to stay afloat. That's the risk. If we're trying to take in a lot of information, we're trying to process the way we were told rationally with limited cognitive capacity. So an illustration of this, an illustration, I, I'm doing very little with my actual data because I thought this audience would probably prefer not as many numbers, graphs, and charts as I go tell my graduate students to look at. Um, but I think I'm going to show you a couple things that I think are useful. Uh, Rick Law and I wrote a book that was published in 2006 called How Voters Decide based on our studies of voter information processing. And, and in that book, we posit four models of decision making. One of those is the traditional rational model, which I've already gone over. Essentially, it is complete search, calculating, putting it all together, and coming up with a value maximizing, utility maximizing option. Our second model is what we call confirmatory decision making. In the confirmatory decision making model, we have limited information search because you already have a preference and all you're doing is confirming it. This is a party voter, right? It's a partisan voter, to put it in partisan context uh, in a general election. If you're a hardcore Republican, a hardcore Democrat, you actually probably don't need very much information to make your decision. People tend to think, for example, that um, uh, uh, people like me know a lot about politics. Oh, I have to, it's part of my job. But I also, you know, spent a lot of years doing politics, as you're going to see in a moment, and in doing those politics, I have a preference. And as I tell my classes when I'm teaching voting behavior, I'm actually the quintessential low information voter. I just need to know which party the candidate belongs to. So, you know, I could spend no time at all paying attention to the election. And that's confirmatory decision making, right? You don't challenge anything. You don't challenge yourself. You don't challenge anything, really. But it is one of the models of decision making in, um, uh, in our book and in what we note in the data in uh, voter decision making. Third model is the heuristic model. In the heuristic model, also known from some other folks as fast and frugal, the idea here is that we limit our information search only to the things we think are most important. We compare our alternatives, just like we do in rationality, but only on the limited things that matter to us. Think of a single issue voter. If you're a single issue voter, what you should do is care about that one issue and learn all your alternatives on that issue and understand the potential outcomes of your decision on that issue. And you can safely ignore everything else. There are other kinds of heuristic voting. There's other kinds of shortcuts people use. Um, confirmatory party, but party can also play the role as a heuristic, right, as a heuristic device. Um, and we've identified a number of things. Polls act that way, <laughs> physical images act that way, and so on. But it's a third kind of search. So we had rational search, the gold standard. We had confirmatory decision making. We have heuristic-based, fast and frugal decision making. And finally, we have intuitive decision making. 
to intuitive decision making really developed out of work that um the nobel laureates herb simon did many, many years ago, a concept that he called satisficing. and satisficing is my good enough is good enough. the idea here is as long as you survive, that's all you need to do. and so when we look at it from a voter standpoint, intuitive decision making looks to us like voters deciding initially on a candidate, then doing a little bit of checking against another candidate just to make sure he, the first candidate's okay. Satisficing, for example, would say, I have a minimum level I want on whatever it is I care about. If the first candidate I run across meets that level, I can stop. I don't have to do anything else. That's good enough. There may be a better candidate out there, but it doesn't matter. I found one who's good enough. And intuitive decision making, there are other kinds, but the satisficing is, is, is the important piece from our perspective on this. So I, I lay those four out, not to get into any more details, but to show you something. In our research, we bring people into a laboratory, we sit them down in front of a mock presidential election campaign with invented candidates. What that means is essentially they know nothing about the candidates until they come into our lab. Now it turns out the candidates are quite, um, uh, quite real. They seem quite real. When we debrief people who go through it, they're like, I want to know who won. This is like really interesting. And, and so that's exactly what you want to hear. It doesn't matter, you know, your candidate won. That's fine because it doesn't make any difference. It isn't real. But we learned after our first few rounds that we needed to tell people that their candidate won. But in any case, <laughs> it's the funny things when you're doing experimental work. But in any case, the more important thing is we were able to identify these four models in our subjects. And what this is measuring, the line is measuring basically the mean probability of voting correctly in our study. Now, what do I mean by that? It's a standard we've set that essentially says you found a candidate who best meets your particular mix of interests. So we don't tell you who the correct candidate is. You get to decide. But the line is the mean in the data. And I want you to look at model one. No matter how much you know or don't know about statistics, you can tell that model one goes down from the middle, right? <laughs> it goes down from the median. In other words, people who use model one, rational decision making in our studies, did a worse job. This is in a primary election, so it's the same party. People who try confirmatory decision making in a primary also did a bad job because party doesn't differentiate in a primary. But who did a good job? The people who used shortcuts. Even more importantly, the good enough is good enough people, the intuitive people. They did the best job. Now, why is that? Part of this is simply we conceive of a political campaign presidential environment as exceedingly information rich. And our subjects have the opportunity to choose as much or as little information as they want about the campaign. Those who try to choose a lot and keep track of two candidates and compare them on all those things, which make them model one voters, were like that duck that the water <laughs> won't go off. And they found themselves sinking. And they did a worse job. Well, it turns out to also be true in the general election. Now, people on average were more likely to find the candidate who best met their interests because partisanship played such a big role in general elections and did in our mock general election as well. So the confirmatory works really well. If you're a Democrat, you know you're a Democrat and the candidates are actually arrayed appropriately, then picking the Democrat works pretty well for you. But model one, again, does not work well even in the general election. Instead, it's confirmatory or intuitive decision making. So it's this kind of stuff, as we started looking at our data, that really caught our eye. I mean, you know, there's a lot of, um, a lot of ideas about rationality and the role that it plays. But one of the things in political science over the years was it really became a normative standard. We should do things this way. And the, key core argument in our book is essentially no. Now, the book ends there. 
Uh, the emotions work that I've done picks up after this. And so the question is, how do we cope? Why do these non-rational strategies work well sometimes? And I would say a lot of the time. And the answer, I think, has to do with emotion and affect. And, and those two words have different technical meanings, but we tend, in, in the stuff I'm doing, to kind of interchange them a lot. So don't be surprised I bounce back and forth between the word emotion and the word affect. But typically, when I'm talking about an affect, I'm thinking about a very specific state, an affective state, or a tag attached to an object. That is, I like so and so, or I like something. But nonetheless, I'll, I'll bounce back and forth a little bit. Um, emotions seem to be the key to decision making, the key to being able to identify a potentially good decision without acquiring too much information. And this book, which I just, I loved, it really influenced me. This was published in 95. It's a popular, accessible version of neuroscience work. Damasio's published more. There's certainly controversy. Not everybody buys it. I don't buy everything in it, but there's a couple really important pieces. And you'll notice the title is Descartes' Error, right? For Damasio, for Antonio and, and uh, Hannah Damasio, who did a lot of the work, although isn't an author on this book, um, Emotions are necessary for making decisions. Descartes' error is, I think, therefore I am, when in fact they argue it's, I feel, therefore I am. And to understand this, you have to start by recognizing that the key to decision making is predicting the future. Right? That's what decisions are about. It's predicting how we're going to feel in the future. What's that future state going to be? Is it going to be a good state? Is it going to be a bad state? And Damasio writes that emotion and feeling assist us with this daunting task of predicting an uncertain future and planning our actions accordingly. He writes, and I, I love this, this picture is a little scary, the, the case of Phineas Gage, um, and he writes about a number of studies of modern brain damaged patients. Um, Gage, in the 19th century, worked on a site blasting rocks. A dynamite blast drove a rod through his head, and he survived. Now, that's the rod, and that's his skull later, of course, <laughs> right? But in surviving, he seemed to be a perfectly normal intellectual capability. He, the doctor called him perfectly rational once he recovered from the injury. But to everybody else, Gage was not Gage. He wasn't who he had been. His personality changed. He had turned into a coarse man who didn't appear to care much about the future. He was just radically different. And key point, he could not make good decisions. He could not plan for the future. So in, in, you know, whatever it may gauge, Gage was gone. Now this happened a long time ago before anybody knew about you know, the details of the brain and so on and so forth. Um, what the Damasios did was did some analysis of the skull to try to see where the damage occurred. And to cut to the chase, the damage occurred in an area of the brain that is known now or thought now to be key for processing emotions. Essentially, his emotional subsystem was destroyed. Not the cognitive system. He could think just fine, but he had no feeling. Ultimately, in looking at him, Damasio was struck by how patients at the University of Iowa with the same area of the brain damage acted very much like contemporary accounts of Gage. Very cold-blooded. Uh, they might be intellectually fine, but know what's going on, but unable to process decisions. He tells the story of a modern patient um, named Elliot who was emotionally contained. He just didn't have an emotion. He was intellectually fine. Um, he had a brain tumor that had damaged his frontal lobe. After the tumor in the lobe was removed, Elliot was no longer Elliot. In many ways, like Gage was no longer Gage. He no longer had a sense of the big picture. He could do a task, but he'd be distracted, he'd start something else, he'd never finish. He made flawed business and financial decisions. His ability to plan was gone. And the best story of this with Elliot is Elliot's attempt to schedule his next appointment. Elliot could pull out his calendar book, back when we actually had calendar books, and go through every day what was going on, talk about it, and go back and forth. But he kept saying, well, this day I've got this open, but I don't have it here. He could not stop. He had no mechanism for taking all that information 
integrating it into a decision and a stopping point and saying, let's do it this day. That's what was missing when he was missing his emotion. Another quick story, also, they devised something called the Iowa Gambling Task. A player sits in front of four decks of cards, is given $2,000 in fake money, told not to lose money, and to try to win as much as possible. Decks A and B have large penalties. Decks C and D do not, and actually have better payoffs. Now, the, the subject doesn't know that at the beginning, and so you start just kind of randomly taking. Subjects begin to prefer A and B initially, but then they start losing big in those decks, and they switch to C and D. That is normal subjects. Subjects with frontal lobe damage in the same area, the emotions area, mirror what they do in real life. They become risk seekers. They turn up more cards in A and B and fewer in C and D. The penalties add up and they go bankrupt. And they can't stop themselves. Even though in the case of Elliot playing this game, he says, I'm low risk, I'm a conservative person. And at the end of the game, he knew intellectually which decks were bad. But playing the game, he could not stop. They repeated it several months later, and the same thing happened, even though intellectually he knew. It turns out, they, they then did a nice little thing where they did skin conductance testing. You basically attach the finger to some wires because the amount of sweat on your hand is a polygraph test. And it's a test of your emotional arousal. So they, they wire them up, they do this, and what they find is that normal patients generate emotional response measured by skin conductance before they start changing decks. And they change decks before they know what's wrong with the decks. They start changing decks before they intellectually know what's happening. The brain damaged patients do not. They show no emotional arousal and they don't do the deck switch. The key point here is that more research after the, this book um, shows that people actually develop intuition before they can describe what happens. We feel before we think. It happens pre-consciously and pre-cognitively. It turns out that we aren't thinking people. We are feeling people on top of which we layer thinking. And a lot of our thinking is in rationalization of what we decided based on our feelings. So oversimplifying this greatly, because I'm taking a long time, um, the key is the gut feeling. Right? It's the sense that you know the decision is right. And it might not even be a, um, a conscious sense, but there's a body sense that you know the decision is right. That's the argument. Right? Um, so far from being in opposition to good decision making, emotions are actually required to make good decisions, or in some case, to make any decision. But on the other hand, and there's always another hand, our parents may in fact have been a bit right. Emotions, affect, can steer us wrong, even if they're critical to functional decision making. And, and I want to wrap up, it's still going to take me a little bit to wrap up, but with something we found in that line, that is the, good, the bad and the good of affect and decision making. When we were looking at people's evaluations of our mock candidates, we found something at, uh, odd. We found that affectively incongruent information generates resistance and strengthens existing evaluations. What do I mean by that? Negative information about a like person results in a more positive evaluation of that person. Think about that. You like someone. You learn something bad about them. You like them even more. Okay? That does not happen. Right? That should not happen in any kind of measure of rational decision making. But in fact, it does. Right? In fact, it does. So I'm hoping by now that, well, oh, I'm sorry, I missed this one little piece. We, this is called motivated reasoning. That is, affect is always implicated in processing new social data. It conditions its evaluation. And if we are motivated towards evaluation, we are motivated to maintain our existing evaluation it's very hard to change it. So I'm hoping at this stage of the game you like me because, well, you'll see, this will take a moment here. This is from an actual political campaign that I was involved in, uh, to put it mildly. 
me more now, right? Because, because here's a piece of negative information about me. You should like me more. Um, I just, I always like having an excuse to actually show that because at the time it happened, I was pretty torn up and sure I lost the election, but I won it with 56% of the vote and I did not take $52,000 from a developer. So here's what goes on with motivated reasoning. You like the target of the new information, so you've got, you know, you're positive about the person and there's new information and it's positive information about the person. That match is okay, everything's fine. It's congruent. You don't process it. You just kind of let it slide through. There's nothing to talk about. It's what you expected. So you update your evaluation. Maybe it goes back in memory a little more positive, but mostly you just good information about someone you like just slides by. But let's say instead it's still somebody you like, but the new information is negative. At this point, affective. The match is not okay. It's bad. It causes us to stop and think. Maybe not really consciously, but it causes us, in effect, to slow down processing, to pay care more careful attention, and in motivated reasoning, what happens is we discount the new information. Oh, it's those guys. That's really bad. I don't trust them anyway. We counter-argue it. Well, you know, he didn't really do that because he's a really good guy. We bolster it. I really like his positions on open space. I like his positions on... And as we do all those things, we put positive thoughts, we put positive links to that person in our head, and we become more positive about the person in spite of the negative information. Now, I'm not saying anything about whether you should trust the source. We're doing some new research now on source effects and trusting. Let's, in all of our studies previously, the source was neutral, the information was presumed true. So that's an important distinction. So motivated reasoning is a problem. This would say, let's go back to rational decision making because the emotions are getting in the way. I'm becoming more positive when I learn true information that's against my expectation. So that would say I should stop and say, no, rationality is not overrated, emotions are a problem, see you all later. Well, it turns out, though, there's another side to this. Emotion is attentional devices. That is emotions grabbing on and telling us you need to pay attention. The idea of in political science, George Marcus and his colleagues call it affective intelligence. Two emotional subsystems, surveillance and disposition. Don't worry about what that means at the moment. Anxiety is the mechanism. Increasing anxiety generates attention and therefore careful processing. Notice in motivated reasoning, what generates attention, stop and think, is simply the disconnect on the information, the affective disconnect. But in affective intelligence, it's another emotion. It's rising anxiety that becomes a mechanism to change what you're doing. And negative information then about a like person triggers anxiety, causing more information search, leading to learning, and maybe even accurate updating. So this is setting emotions on the other side of motivated reasoning. So using my cute little picture here again, uh, you're feeling good. Right, so you're in good shape, things are going well, it's sunny out, you're walking over here, the wind's whispering in the trees, and you hear the birds, whatever. Um, the surveillance system is just watching out, it's always watching out. And something comes in, it's positive information, the surveillance system says, nothing to look at here, everything's okay, no problem, continue on the concurrent course, the dispositional system just keeps you going, don't pay any attention to it. But Let's say it's negative information. The surveillance system goes, hey, negative information coming, bad thing coming, bad thing coming. What's my current affective state? Oh, I'm feeling good. That's not good. That's not good. It's not okay. Anxiety is generated. The disposition system that keeps you moving forward is interrupted. And in interrupting disposition, you stop and think. You assess. You evaluate. You respond. And you have something akin to rational processing but it's rational processing generated by an emotional process, by an emotional subsystem. And in fact, it would then look like this, right? Negative stuff, you would become more negative. It turns out when we do the research on this, when we look at our data, this is exactly what we find. Early effects of motivated reasoning, but as anxiety builds, as the information environment becomes more threatening to the expectations, People actually get more anxious. As they get more anxious, they start thinking. 
Now, there's an important caveat, right? We all know things like test anxiety. Anxiety has can cut both ways. Too much undifferentiated anxiety that is not targeted in a particular direction can be really problematic. But I'm talking here in our studies about anxiety about whether my belief about this candidate is true or not. And that seems to generate more, I hesitate to call it that, but I did, rational processing. So the idea looks like this, that as threat to expectations increases, anxiety increases. As anxiety increases, the motivated reasoning process is interrupted and updating proceeds in what would be the normatively correct direction. We call this an affective tipping point. Essentially, what we find is that emotions play both a negative and a positive role in evaluation and choice, but they play a role. They play a role. There is no such thing as separating emotion from reason and keeping these things separate. The key is the motivational goal. If the motivational goal is evaluation, motivated reasoning is going to happen. If the motivational goal is accuracy, we see something akin to affective intelligence. And that motivational goal is what we see switch in our subjects when the political environment becomes threatening to their pre-existing conditions. And that's the environmental factor. So is rationality overrated? Well, we know that emotion conditions how new information is evaluated. Sometimes it helps. Gut feelings that are often right. Shortcuts that simplify things. Increasing awareness of the decision environment that actually improves our decision-making process. Right? So in some ways, it's not always overrated. And sometimes, emotions don't help. Motivated reasoning causes problems. We may fail to consider alternatives. Regardless, the key point, the key takeaway here is that no matter what we were ever told, no matter what we've been told by the Enlightenment and everything else, we cannot make decisions without emotions. There is no such thing as cool, rational decision making that doesn't implicate our emotional systems in storm, some form or another. And I checked on this. I asked somebody who ought to know. So that's it. I thought Spock would be a great ending here. It does seem logical, but the other thing, I found a clip from one of the shows where Spock's actually laughing, right? So I thought that would be a cute ending. So that's it. That's kind of my pitch, and I'm happy to answer questions. <laughs> or, or maybe I'm happy to create more questions. I'm not sure which. Yeah. I just had a clarifying question. When you talked about your study, uh, Using the four, he was using the four different decision-making models. How do you define doing better or doing worse? The, the question: How do we define doing better or doing worse? Which is obviously a key part of of what we're arguing here. The the concept is something we call correct voting, since it's done in a voting context, in a in election context. Um, a correct vote is the vote. At its simplest, a correct vote is the vote you would cast under conditions of full information. So if you could have that hypothetical world where you could know everything about everything, what, which way would you vote? If you vote that way, with, you, know, you voted correctly. Now, it's an important point, though. We're not saying what should go into your decision. So if you're a voter who only cares about two issues, as long as you vote correctly for the candidate who best meets your desires on those two issues, you voted correctly by our standards, even if I would stand here as a political scientist and say, you idiot, don't you see this candidate, this, 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 you're just wrong. Well, they're not wrong, because we leave it to the voter to decide what matters to them. But the basic idea is the vote you would cast under conditions of full information would be a correct vote. And in our studies, it's impossible to have full information simply because there's too much. So our question is, how close do people come to that? No, and I, I would not, I don't mean to suggest it's less accurate. 
I, I really don't. Um, we use the phrase intuitive model, or the intuitive model, or intuitive decision making. Um, it's kind of, a, there are several pieces beyond the satisficing that I didn't go into, but it, none of that's intended to suggest it's not, um, uh, it's not just as good. I mean, if you, you make a correct decision, you make a correct decision by our standard. So you either voted correctly or didn't vote correctly, and if the data shows that your strategy appeared to be a satisficing strategy or some other intuitive strategy, then that strategy is, is better, frankly, than some other strategy. I mean, that's essentially what we show, is that the people in our study, these are randomized experimental studies, laboratory studies, so the, the people who do different kinds of strategies aren't necessarily different outside of that. That is, we can wash out any other differences. Ultimately, so ultimately, to come back real simply, no, I don't mean to suggest it's not uh, the right decision, or not the right way to do it even. It's going to depend a lot on, on the circumstances. Yeah. Well, what is the health and quality of the study, uh, and how do you have all the results in the data to be able to tell if you did this in the study, yeah. uh, and specifically, I would have to ask how uh, certain folks from the other study get the data to be given in the model. Yeah, when we, when we started this uh, work, we did not want to confuse things with sources, in a sense, because sources matter. There's, there's no question about it. People are going to ascribe affect and belief to different sources differentially. So we were not interested in that at that stage. So the way we present the information, subjects basically sit in front of the computer, and they select from information that's constantly changing on the screen. So what do they want to learn? And over a typically 20 to 25 minutes. And so there are roughly 100 and something pieces of information about every candidate. They can't learn it all. So they're guided by what they want to learn. The way the information is presented is completely neutral so that it isn't sourced. It just comes up on the, as a card on the screen. It, it doesn't say who said it. Sometimes there's a quote from the candidate. You know, it's presumed to be a true quote from the candidate. But we didn't go beyond that in terms of source effects or sourcing the information. Um, the other thing that, um, uh, uh, that we did with this information was made it plausible, generally. So it's, it's very plausible that the candidate has this particular position. Some of it is issues. Some of it are personality traits, um, background information, family information polls, endorsements, so a whole range of things you would see in a campaign. Yeah, no, no, right, and what I'm saying is there is no channel. It just is presented on the screen. It's, and, and in talking with subjects afterwards in debriefing, they take it as true information, but we don't source it in any way. Now, more recently, we're working on studies that are sourcing it. We've got several graduate students doing dissertation work right now where they're playing with liberal sources, conservative sources, mainstream sources, and attributions of where the information is coming from as well, and they're doing it systematically in the studies. But we put a lot of control on the studies on the information. No, that, that's, we started these studies long before Twitter and Facebook existed. And so at the moment, that's also not a part, although I've got a, a couple of junior colleagues at, a, at another institution we're working with me on a, um, on a social media aspect to these studies where we're trying to understand how information flowing from social context uh, in, in, is, is processed. So we're only just starting to deal with that. So you found that uh, the, the inability to feel anxiety can impair decision making. Uh, what about other emotions? Um, I mean, there's a wide, a wide range, or is it more of like an all or nothing proposition where the part of your brain that feels anxiety is damaged, you also have trouble feeling like euphoria or other emotions? What's, what's really interesting um, so far in the, the, the political science side of emotions work, firstly, is that positive emotions don't differentiate. That is, you can't readily differentiate the various positive emotions. It turns out that's actually quite true uh, uh, with the folks who work on emotions primarily. 
That is, what we find is whether we try to identify enthusiasm or euphoria or happiness, they don't differentiate. They don't act differently as far as we can observe from an observed action. Negative emotions, however, do differentiate. And they differentiate primarily in both um, uh, anxiety-related emotions and aversive emotions. So run, run, moving away emotions, anger, for example. Generally, in political studies, when we get differentiation on emotion on the negative side, it's between anxiety or worry and anger. And the distinction typically is that the anxiety appears to put the body, put the brain into heightened awareness, heightened interest, trying to figure out what's going on. It's a little bit like uh, I use with my students. Imagine the, um, you know, imagine the caveman wandering down the savanna on a beautiful day, and the birds are chirping, you hear the wind, and he's you know, just kind of wandering around, and suddenly a saber-toothed tiger appears on the horizon. Right? Should he pay attention to the nice, positive stimuli, or should he pay attention to the potential threat in the environment? Well, obviously, if he didn't pay attention to the threat, we wouldn't have little cavemen wandering around. So ultimately, that anxiety, the threat side of things, does seem to kind of make us pay attention. The anger side, however, often um, plays a very different role. Sometimes it just shuts us down. Right? It, it, it just, we get angry, we get frustrated, we can't deal with it. And a lot depends on whether we have a clear target of the anger or it's a more diffuse kind of anger. So with our particular study, we've been very focused on the anxiety side. So I don't have a whole lot in our studies to say about the other pieces. Well, you know, this has been one political scientist that's uh, been running around for a long time because it, it, it doesn't make any sense to go out and vote. From the standpoint, from the standpoint of your vote being determinative, there is no way you can argue that the benefit to you, which is whatever benefit you get from your candidate winning, times the probability your vote matters, that's pretty close to zero. And the cost of voting is definitely not not zero. It may not be huge, but it's non-zero. So rationally, the cost of voting has to outweigh the benefit, the expected benefit, the expected value. On the other hand, one possible solution to this is that the benefits are far greater than simply what policy you will get if your candidate wins and whether you'll be the determinant voter or not. Many people, and I'm one of these, right? I get great benefit out of the very civic act of voting. It is part of how I see myself, right? I get it's the civic duty. And to me, doing my civic duty is important, and I feel good about it, right? And that offsets whatever costs, at least I rationalize that it offsets the cost of going over to the uh, voting location, figuring out where my precinct actually is, looking at these names that I don't recognize and realizing I should because I'm a political scientist <laughs> and all the rest of that, right? So, so what, what really it comes down to is you can't, you can't, you, you can't do the traditional cost-benefit unless you can assess additional benefits. And most of those are essentially psychological benefits. That doesn't make them not real. They're very real. Right? And that's why you have, basically, um, people who are just consistent voters, that they vote all the time. I, my primary in June, there was literally no primary at any level in my community. It was you know, one person for every seat all the way down the ballot. I voted anyway. I, wa I literally I walked in there and I thought, I'm just going to push the button so the people are already there and there's no one to cho choose from. And I was the third voter and it was 6 p.m. <laughs> so I, in the end, in the end, there's just more to it than this simple cost benefit. And the, that there are benefits that go well beyond the traditional paradigms is what it really comes down to. Now, it also is true, and I, I kind of said this, right? It also is true that if everyone didn't vote, 
then your vote would matter a huge amount, right? And it is true that we all know stories about elections that were decided on one vote or two votes. And, and you know, in some ways, those of us who care about these things, who are voters, don't want to have that day come when it was by one vote and who didn't vote, right? I mean, that's, so that comes into play too. But the bottom line is, you've got to go beyond the traditional paradigms that kind of say, why should it come from us? You know, it, it, unfortunately, I actually don't know the answer to that. You would think that I would, but in the study in which we looked at the tipping point, we did not look at correct voting. And the reason we didn't was because of the way we had to design a study that limited some of our ability to calculate the correct voting. But looking at what people did, what, our, our system allows us to track what people do. So we know everything they looked at, the order in which they looked at it, how long they looked at it, which is, a, which is a nice proxy for processing time, for how much effort they're making. And what we found is that as that threat increased, we reached a point where, where people stopped just kind of taking it in and began to search for alternatives. So that's the first indicator to us. They're actually no longer only looking at the candidate they like, which is what people do most of the time once they like somebody. They tend to ignore the other side. But instead, we begin to see search change. We begin to see it move across candidates and move across candidates in ways that reflect the particular issues that voter appears to be interested in based on the pre-study questionnaire that they do for us. So in those, those seem to indicate we would see some very positive effects in that sense. Um, the risk, however, is still the risk of model one, which is if you become driven to start trying to collect lots of information about all your other alternatives in any kind of complex environment, you could in fact become information overloaded, even with this processing. So I wouldn't argue that it's a panacea necessarily, but what I'd argue is that it's important to recognize the role that, the, that, that emotion and affect plays in the decision making. A really good question. Particularly, I'm, 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 you know, think about the debate last week. I think about how immediately after the Obama Romney debate, the the Obama surrogates didn't even show up right away in the spin room, and if you turned over to MSNBC, they were virtually crying, right? As opposed to pushing back, as opposed to making arguments. Well, well, you know, anytime anything's gone wrong on the Republican side, you're right. There's this tendency to just, you know. Close ranks and go. We all kind of have that feeling that Democrats are just fuzzier about these but things. But is there any in general. That I don't know. We haven't looked at it on the partisan side. It would be, you know, we could. We actually have those right. data, so yeah. it would not be hard to go back to our data, split it by uh, partisanship, and see if we see differences in the way people respond to the information. That's a kind of a cool idea. And just lastly, as well, I mean, 
know, I, you know, I'll tell you what. I, I got the jersey. I got the jersey this time around in the, in the uh, summer of 2009, so the election campaign was underway. You know, I don't actually think New Jerseyans suddenly lost it in some fashion. Every campaign is unique. And in the, in the context of 2009, it's after the collapse, the financial collapse, our governor, John Corzine, makes no real case for why he actually should be governor. He runs a really poor campaign. He doesn't have an argument. Um, he was a Wall Street guy, which isn't exactly a good thing when Wall Street has collapsed and you're next to it. And um, uh, Chris Christie stood up and effectively, he didn't say it in these words, but he acted as a leader. So one of the things we see in our polling about Christie is Republicans, and this is actually to your, your, your earlier point too, Republicans in our polling, we have a series, we have a battery of positive and negative traits we ask about the governor, as well as emotional questions. That's the political scientist to me. We don't typically talk a lot about that in our public polling, but this battery are things like you know, leadership or bullying, right? So those kinds of words. How well do these words describe the governor? And you get one word at a time in random order. Republicans ascribe all the positive traits to the governor and none of the negative traits. Democrats ascribe all the negative traits and most of the positive traits to the governor. So Democrats say, he's a bully. Damn it, he's a leader. And, and that's what actually I think happened in 2009 in New Jersey. You had a guy here, he also made his name you know, putting politicians in jail, which is you know, a, a standard event in New Jersey anyway. <laughs> and, and he just had, you know, he had this image that, look, I'm gonna leave. And I think even voters who didn't particularly like where he was going to leave essentially said, we really need a leader. He won, not by very much, but you'd think now from the national media that he had a blowout election and he's godlike in New Jersey. His ratings have stayed basically 50-50 since he was elected, right? People either love him or they hate him. But even the ones who hate him think he's a leader. <laughs> um, well, you do that study to answer my first question, I want to get started. <laughs> <laughs> you have to give me your card. Yeah. <laughs>
of this is simply, in some sense, disciplinary training and ways that of uh, ways of thinking, ways of looking, right at at questions. I'm trained as a political psychologist. I'm trained in experimental method. I'm trained as a scientist, and I say that with a grin because um, I'm in a field that has the word science on its name. And I had a, a, a somebody once tell me, you know, any field that has the word science on its name isn't a science. That came from a biologist. Right? <laughs> and and there's you know there's a little bit of that going on in my field. I really often feel like there is this science wannabe thing that has really driven us to become quite quantitative, quite um, uh, uh, quite focused on you know new techniques in modeling, new statistical abilities, and so on and so forth. Um, and of course, no matter what, you know my training comes in that discipline. I also have to speak to that discipline. Right? And so a lot of what we do when we design our studies is intended, of course, to speak to political psychologists. Because psychology is a similar discipline in, in this aspect of psychology, the social psychology side. So, you know, in, in some ways, I am actually very um, uh, sympathetic. I, I, I think what you're saying is, yes, right? I don't know how to do that. And I admit that, right? It's not the way I've been trained to think. And in some ways, one of the neat things about coming here and, and um, uh, uh, the, the 21st Century Center doing this is, you know, I, I presume that I have some number of humanities scholars and people interested in that way of thinking, right, in the audience, which is good. It's really good for me. It's really interesting. And on my I'd, I'd love someday to do something that was cross those lines, you know, on that long list of all the things we'd love to do someday, right? But I'll just admit straight up, it's really hard for me to think in that way, but I will actually accept much of what you say, no question. When it came to the studies, we design, from an experimental design standpoint, your primary goal is to hold constant everything you're not interested in studying. So if I'm interested in studying um, the effects of campaign information you know, as people acquire it, I need to hold constant as much as I can of the environment. And that's why I didn't want to play with sources at that point or with outside influences, or right because I needed a really clean environment to get my piece, my little tiny corner of the whole thing. Um, but I really had, had some interesting opportunities. The, the software we developed to do this is actually generally available. It's free and available. It's a web-based system that people who want to do process-type research in any field can use. And we've expanded it just recently. We, I haven't used it this way yet to create a social environment. So we now have an environment in which the experimenter can set the environment, and then people going through it can share comment, like, not like, um, right, get whole comment streams going with a goal ultimately of being able to do that in a simultaneous environment where you could get people into a lab, because these are still lab studies, where they could be assigned into groups, you know, blue eyes and brown eyes, you know, whatever, assigned into groups, and then create this group affiliation and share within the group or across the group. I'm really interested in many more things than the little bit piece that we've been able to do with this at this point. But I also recognize I've got some severe limitations on, on just the way I view the world and think about it that don't get me, you know, that block me from getting to some of those places right now. So, but it's fun to, to think about this, it really is.
I, I don't want to call it the production of a rational logical decision. I want to call it the production of the right decision for you at that moment based on what's available to you in making that decision. But the, say correct voting is a lot shorter. The, the, because it doesn't have to be rational in the sense that we've thought of rationality, right? Um, but to go to the initial part of your comment, and again, maybe this is my training as an experimentalist, I feel like I need a standard to judge against, right? I feel like I have to have somewhere to go. I mean, Steve wants to say something. And, well, I was just saying that. Right. I, question, I mean, you know, you're familiar with Henry and David's work. Yeah. He's done stuff on, on emotion, and he's looking at the influence on, on information co uh, uh, processing and the cognitive points. And he does a lot of the anger and the hate, and he doesn't look at correct no. choice and correct. He's looking at how people move through and how they process information and how the emotions affect that and information yeah. processing. And he's yeah. less interested precisely because a rational choice theorist is interested in outcome validity. He's more interested in process validity. Yeah, and that that's actually a, a good point, Steve. I appreciate you making it. I hadn't actually thought about Davis stuff really recently. I was for a while, and he you know, did a paper for for the edited volume that I did. And then, but, but you're right, of course. We could be simply, I won't say simply, we could be interested in the processes, in understanding. And in some extent, we started there. Because our initial, we didn't have the, the correct voting standard. We didn't have a standard when we started these studies way back. We were really just really interested in what kind of search patterns we saw and what predicted those patterns and how those patterns uh, this was before I was doing the emotion piece, but how the availability of information in various ways affected the search mechanism, the search pattern. But again, I think it may simply be um, my own way of looking at the world. I really felt like I needed an outcome. I needed something to judge against. Well, can we go all the way then to internal validity, emotion to the same emotions? So I'm thinking of Edmund and Rose Baxter Landers, who will Yeah, I think actually that's that's a good way to think about it, right? I mean, emotions aren't just in the service of decision making, right? They're in the service of all kinds of things that go on in our daily lives. And it, one of the really interesting things about about the brain function on emotions is that we process affect our affective system cycles faster than our cognitive system. We literally feel before we think. We feel before we're aware. We don't live in continuous time. We live in these 200 millisecond slices. They look continuous to us, but that's how fast the conscious system processes, about 200 milliseconds. Long and cognitive. Yeah, exactly. And the, un the, the affect is processed in about 50 milliseconds, much, much faster. And, and it serves us not just to make decisions, but to do all kinds of things in terms of how we feel about ourselves, how we think about ourselves, how we reinforce who we are, right? Which goes way well below just cognitive processing. Yeah, yeah. I thought that, that's a really useful, useful way to think. Yeah. Um, and why why uh, Leslie framed uh, the, the talk? It seems that what you've done to a great extent in your research show the cognitive role of emotions and how emotions are part of a wider conception of who I am that is sort of the caricature of uh, emotions and using them as two keys that completely you know, all these the fights that are right. wrong ones right. that in fact they, they're kind of part of the same team but they have different roles to play and that we get rid of one and the other then So maybe even even if it's you know, rationality overrated, even if it's more, even doesn't rationality have to include? Well, I think that's what I, where I tried to end up in a sense, and I, I use the overrated partly because again, it, the whole rational choice paradigm is just kind of 
took over a lot of disciplines, but really took over our discipline. And, and you know, somewhat on the side I'm on, which is political behavior, even more so on you know, things like foreign policy, international relations. And, and I just, I, you know, so I start from there. I start from trying to tell sometimes other audiences of, you know, my, my more direct colleagues in terms of what we do, you know, this rationality thing you're talking about, there's, you know, it's just, you know, you're, you're, you're giving it way too much, right? So I think what you said, what you said is what I meant to try to come to, which is these things are intertwined. They are absolutely intertwined. You cannot pull them apart. And the idea that we could have reason separate from emotion, that we can think and put our feelings aside, just is not true. And if we don't have those feelings, we really, in effect, we can think, but we can't think with purpose, is what it, is what it kind of comes down to. So yeah, not two teams competing, but two squads on the same team. We're really, we're, we are really bad about being open to possibilities once we've made, you know, once we've got an evaluation in mind, once we know what we believe, right? We are really bad at it. So that's, that's an interesting thought that, that perhaps that's part of what's going on. This is, it's difficult ultimately with the tools we have. We can't see this happening, right? We're inferring everything we're talking about from data we can see, but at best we're inferring it Right? And so um, the, the, that, I, that just strikes me as a really interesting thought and worth some exploration to try to understand a little more of what's going on at the point when people go, wow, there's something weird here and it's disturbing me. And we could even, I could imagine doing that even in the lab in some sense of interrupting, you know, reaching, trying to identify that point, which I think we can identify and then just interrupting the experiment and having people reflect on where they are, what they've been thinking, what's going on, getting that kind of data, which I think is actually useful data, not used a lot by political scientists, but, but interesting stuff. Well, yeah, go ahead, last question, and then I have probably four things. Well, as an historian, I try to, you know, I think that there is a nice kind of record of voting in the past that we can look at. And I, I was thinking, I see cars all around the United States where there are old bumper stickers yeah. that say, you know, Mondale. <laughs> <laughs> and I think that's very interesting, right? This is a person who feels like they they voted correctly yeah. at a certain time. Yeah. And this affects their ability to be human today. And I was thinking, uh, is there a way of, I was, I mean, there's an emotion also like regret. I don't know. Oh, yeah. Like, you, yeah. like people who yeah. thought, I made an incorrect choice. Yeah. I, I mean, I think people do. I mean, I think people bring a lot to their decision making on the vote, and I think we we can only tap so much of that when we're putting it in a laboratory. In fact, you know that constrains them. I think it, I I think yes, people's identity, people who care at all about politics and vote consistently, tend to build an identity 
around that. And, and you do end up seeing you know, the bumper stickers that are still there. And uh, you know, I, 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 driving around where I am, I still see um, you know, W with lines slashed through them and all of this kind of stuff. And it, it um, I, you know, I do think, I mean, I, I guess I don't have a whole lot to say other than I think you're right that this all comes into play as people are, are thinking about what they're going to do next. Regret is an interesting thing, though. Um, one, one fascinating outcome that seems to always happen in our, in our national voting studies is post-election, the winner has more votes in the post-election study than the winner could have possibly had in the post-election study. And it's really happened, especially in cases like Nixon, uh, McGovern, soon after, before Watergate, you know, everybody voted for the winner. After Watergate, suddenly, if you'd ask who did you vote for in 1972, it was a much closer election <laughs> than it had been. So, so regret in that form seems sometimes to actually have people change what they think the past was, right? And we know that the past is malleable. We don't, you know, how we view the past tends to be constructed as we go. And I think it's funny because I don't think people are lying to us. I don't think they intend to say, you know, well, I know I voted for Kevin. Let me say I voted for Nixon. I think they just tend to remember that they voted for the winner. Or in the case of after Watergate, you know, didn't vote for the Worse than a job talk. Come on. <laughs> or just talk with one another. So please uh, feel free to come join us in the night.